turn over to 246 in the red book and uh, we'll uh, do this come and dine and see let's all stand on this one Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed he invites his chosen people come and dine with his manna he doth feed and supplies our every need Oh, tis sweet to sup with Jesus all the time Come and dine, the master called it Come and dine You may feast at Jesus' table all the time He who fed the multitude Turned the water into wine To the hungry call it now Come and dine the disciples came to land, thus obey Christ's command. For the master called to them, come and dine. There they found their heart desire, bread and fish upon the fire. Thus he satisfies the hungry all the time. Come and dine, the master called, come and dine. Be 
who fed the multitude, turn the water into wine, to the hungry calling now, come and dine. Soon the Lamb will take his bride to be ever at his side. All the host of heaven will assemble be. Oh, to be a glorious sight, all the saints in spotless white. And with Jesus they will feast eternally. Come and dine, the Master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. hungry to hear the word, aren't you? So we come to dine. Amen. Remember the announcements. Remember the, the uh, Bible study this coming Saturday. And then remember the fellowship meeting will be here on the third Saturday in March. So remember these and just keep everything in mind. Remember the Sweetheart Banquet will be on the 14th. And all just remember all the announcements. And like Terrence says, they roll down the stairs all the time. So they put it up downstairs. If you ever want to know what's next, just go downstairs and, and it'll roll the screen and tell you what's coming up. Amen. Did you enjoy this morning's message? Looking forward to this afternoon. Amen. Well, okay, then let's just do as we sing. Let's open our hearts, all right? Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. Turn around, shake them by his hand, and say, God bless you. Thanks for being an overcomer. Thanks for being an overcomer. Thanks for being an overcomer. God bless you. Bless you too, man. Hmm? Yeah. I bl thank you for being an overcomer. When Dick gets finished overcoming, I'm going to laugh. I said, when you get finished overcoming, I'm going to shake your hand. God bless you. Overcoming the guitar, he has to unstrap everything to get out of that hole over there he's in. Brother Dick, uh, boy, solid, did a, always done a wonderful job. Always doing a good job. Thank the Lord for him. Uh, not many as steady as he is. That's, but uh, I forgot something. No, I'm okay. I'm okay. We're here. See, that's running off on me. Thank you, Brother Dick. Appreciate that. It's <laughs> rubbing off. Second Peter 1. We, golly. Gee. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Good for each and every one of you to come back and, and maybe enjoy a little blessing. <clears throat> We're all uh, 
we're all just one in Christ, you know. We no big eyes, no little use. We're all we're all in the same boat. I like that what Brother Branham says. There's no difference in you and the drunk man, except you're a sinner saved by grace, and he hadn't got there yet. That's the only difference. And me and you, I've always said we we sometimes we we try to isolate ourselves from humanity, but you know what? We're still humans. We still have human feelings and emotions. So, brother. See the heading of it. This part? Oh, pull it down a little bit. Hey, listen, we got the young guns back there. You see Brother Joe sitting out here, and you see, I think, Brother, there you go. Yeah, that's the title. I'm sorry. That's the title to it. But uh, Brother Michael is, Penumwe is running the camera today. Yay. So we go. Take <laughs> <Pick> him out. <laughs> I told him, I said, when you get bored, just let that thing go round and round. <laughs> Turn one of them on, just let it go round and round. And um, Brother uh, Zach Black is on the quotes, and Brother Josiah is sitting in Captain Kirk's chair, his dad, and he's running the helm back there. So but thank God for these young people, you know. Let, let these... Uh, <clears throat> Let the older ones enjoy service out here. Brother Benny and some of them don't get to sit with their wives. And, and like dads, you know, one time mom's, dad hadn't sat with mom for years, you know, until the other day. I think he went back there and sat with her. But if you have a job, it kind of pulls you away from your, from your spouse. So, but you know what? That's, uh, that's our calling, and that's what, uh, that's what we're to do. So 2 Peter 1, and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We will... Uh, uh, you can read the announcements downstairs because they're all down there. There's no need to announce any of them. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, that you'd bless this day, Father, and take care of us. <clears throat> be with us through this journey. We ask you to be with the ones that are sick. We see Brother Gary's not here today, so something must be a little wrong in his body, Lord. We ask you right now that you would strengthen him, knowing that he's watching in, that you'll give him courage, Father, and give him strength for the journey that lies ahead of him. Yes. <clears throat> and let each of us have that strength faith or that strong faith, that virtue faith that will go to him, Lord, and help him make and be stronger. Father, give us our daily bread today and forgive us of our sins. Be with the ones that are not here, the other ones that we haven't called. Brother Hal there coming through that. Cole, Father, we pray that you just bless each one of our bodies, Lord. Yes. Touch us in soul also today, Father. Give us something that we can uh, make a part of our spiritual life and, and grow more in you, Lord. We ask you to just take care of us now. Lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> 2 Peter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have t obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You can make yourself part of that, or you cannot make yourself part of that. All right, to them that have obtained like precious faith. All right, that didn't mean that Peter got a faith and then we're going to get a different faith. Right. Peter gets the faith, and we get the same faith, all right? And you know what it'll do? It'll make you act the same way, all right? Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus our Lord, sorry. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given. I like that. That's why I made that word a different color, given. They're given to us. Exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's what we were talking about this morning, turning, going away. Then God will take that away. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, temperance patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory. That new birth turns you in a direction, but these virtues make you. Right. If you if you develop if they develop in you as <clears throat> as true Holy Ghost virtues, they're going to turn. Hey, how do you think we're going to get this thing under control? There's no way to get this under control under present conditions, under just faith alone. Right. Right. Faith alone won't do it. Faith alone will save you give you the new birth, and put you in the kingdom of God. Right. But does it make you a full um, Christian that God can use? No. Right. Not to the degree he wants to use you. Right. All right? Right. But you have the opportunity, 
as we read the quote, Brother Brown says, it's just how high your faith is. For if things be in you and abound, they make you. In other words, they turn your whole attitude that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. There's a lot of people who have a problem with revelation. Like we were yes. talking about this morning, they have a problem with revelation. Well, they're born again, but they can't see afar off. Right. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Right. Lord, add his blessing to the reading of his word. You can be seated. You shall never fall. I, uh, <clears throat> at the end of service last Sunday, you know, we sang that song, It Is Well With My Soul. I just want to make a comment on that. Have you ever looked up the story behind that? Because it, it's really a striking uh, story that we sang there, and it kind of lifted everybody up a little bit. And uh, being lifted up, I, uh, Sister um, Milka said, have you ever read the story about the man that actually penned It Is Well With My Soul? Well, his name is Horatio Spafford. All right, these hymns were written, I got this off of, of Wikipedia. The hymn was written after a traumatic event in Spafford's life because if you listen to this for a minute, you'll never forget the lyrics of this song and what this man was going through when he wrote this verse these verses. The first was the 1871 Great Chicago Fire, which ruined him financially. He was a successful lawyer. He had owned real estate, and the 1871 Chicago Fire um, wiped him out. All right. His business interests were further hit by the economic downturn in 1873, at which time he had planned to travel to Europe with his family on the SS Villa de Haver. In a late change of plans, he sent the family ahead while he was delayed on business concern, business concerning zoning problems following the Great Chicago Fire. While crossing the Atlantic, the ship sank rapidly after colliding with another sea vessel, and all four of Spafford's daughters died. Lost four daughters. Think about that. He lost four dollars, four daughters, and his wife was the only survivor. She continued on to England. Well, he was coming, but the, the story behind all this, uh, and I want you to see, is this man was a, was a devout Christian. He was a student of Dwight Moody and Ira Sankey. He was actually going to Europe to see Dwight Moody. So he was a devout Christian man, and watch what happened here, though. His daughters died. His wife, Anna, survived and sent him the now-famous telegram, Saved Alone. Shortly afterwards, as Spafford traveled to meet his grieving wife, now think about that. That's, it wasn't like they got on a plane and went over there. It took him a month to get there, to get from Chicago to the port in New York and then on a vessel over to, to England. So she had to wait on him. But afterwards, <clears throat> shortly afterwards, as Spafford traveled to meet his grieving wife, he was inspired to write these words as his ship passed near where his daughters died. And he wrote this verse. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like seas billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to know it is well. It is well with my soul. A man that lost four daughters, lost all of his earnings, Looked like the guy should have just give up. He pens one of the greatest songs, greatest Christian songs ever written. So you'll never sing that song again without realizing that man, the sorrow he was going through when he wrote that song. And then he continues on. And he doesn't even go back to Chicago because you know what they said? The people in Chicago said, there must be something wrong with you because God has laid all these plagues on you. So he went to Jerusalem and he died in Jerusalem on his 69th birthday and never went back to the United States because they told him that he, had must, he was a secret sinner and he must have done something wrong. It's why God was laying all these plagues on him. No, I believe it was for that song. It was for that song that now has meaning. When sorrows like beat, seas billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to know it is well with my soul. Amen. The Lord does some things for us. And we don't understand them, but you'll understand them in by and by. He probably died thought, thinking he was a failure. 
because a man named Paul Bliss is the one that actually put the uh, music to the to the song, and then it's been sang all over the world by different people. So I, I enjoy the song, but I enjoy it more now that knowing that a man was was in such sorrow and tragedy till he could pen one of the greatest songs in the world. So, all right, let's get started. Uh, this morning, of course, we backed up a little bit, but that's okay. But we started with justification, sanctification, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a new birth. All right. <clears throat> we remember that we were looking in Ephesians 4, verse 11. We're going to read it. Next one down. Bob just jumped right over Zach. You didn't hear him hit the wall back there? No, just kidding. Because we're going to roll through this pretty quick. And I had a few points I wanted to make. He gave some of, I want you to see this, though. This is, this is how we're going to get it. So there's no other way. I don't, you know, just beat it in your brain. This is how you're going to get it. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Right. Three things for the work of the ministry. I wish we had time to minister on all three of those because it's perfecting of the saints, work of the ministry, and edifying of the body. All right? Till we all come, and it's, look, it didn't separate this group. This group's in this. Right. Okay? For the edifying of the body. So that just dumps everybody into that one, into that one uh, office as we're all Christians. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Amen. Now let's go to the quote that I want to read. Quote number one <clears throat> that we've been reading before, but I want you to really get this because it is. It's, it's, it's your, you must be born again. And when you're born again, you can't be born again without having faith. That's right. So you see on my chart here, I got the very foundation. Faith is the foundation of all of it. Right. Down, scroll it down to the, to the top there, Brother Zach. You're possessed of one that dominates your life. It just depends on how much faith you have is how high you can rise. Right. All right? And I want you, you say, well, you keep reading it over again. I want you to realize that it's up to you. That's right. And if you're born again, you already have the faith. Right. You just got to exercise it. Right. You got to get it out. There's got to be a way like, like with virtue, when we were reading that, we're not going to read the quote. Remember, Brother Brown said, I've got to have an outlet. There's got to be an outlet to get that virtue out. Because <clears throat> it's an outward expression of an inward work. Right. Same way with, you know, like water baptism. Water baptism doesn't save you, but it's an outward expression of an inward work. Now, what is the inward work? Right. Right. Peter said, repent. That's the inward work. Right. Right. Peter said, repent. You can bury them, you can baptize them a hundred thousand times. Unless they've repented, that does them no good. Right. Just makes them actually two more fo two fold more child of hell if you don't teach them right. Because right. they'll think their baptism is what saved them. Right. And it's not. It's an outward expression. These virtues are all an outward expression of an inward work that God is in there doing the work, not you. Right. All right? All right, but look, but remember, faith alone won't do it. You've got to have faith, but it's how high you can rise after you get that faith. All right, you get that faith, and then you've got to rise up higher than just faith alone because faith alone won't do it. All right, and you've got to have a substance faith. The faith that we have, the faith that we have at the new birth is a substance faith. All right, brother, they'll preach on that not too long ago on substance faith. But the substance of that faith, I believe, is these virtues because you can't have, it's like Brother Dale always said, I'm born again, I'm born again. But when I get my body changed, yes, right. that's when I, amen? That's when I'll be born again because you still got this guy that you know came from those two people right there. Amen? But when we're changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, We'll have one like he has. We'll be him made manifest. Right. We are that inside. Right. But as we are down here on earth, that's what we have got to have to get this body changed. Right. One more time. If we don't have this, brothers and sisters, anybody on the internet, wherever, if we don't have these virtues in our life, 
there's no way we can take a body change because there's always going to be a hindrance. This is going to be a hindrance. Right. What those virtues are doing is they're, they're moving that hindrance out of the way. Amen. Like I said, giving you, a, giving you a virtue faith, which is a strong faith. Not just faith, gives you a strong faith. Give you some faith with power. All right, we, Acts 1.8. <clears throat> Going up to Acts 1.8, uh, or go to virtue. Because virtue faith is what we have to have next. I think he had it already up there a minute ago, which is, that's, a, that's okay. There you go. Got to have that virtue faith, which is what? Strength or strong faith. And then in Acts 1 and 8, Jesus tells us, he says, hey, I'm going to give you power after. Right. I'm going to give you power after that the Holy Ghost has come on you. The Holy Ghost comes, then you get the power. All right? <clears throat> As Sister Anna Kamani was... was Said she had always wondered about how they, you know, how they stacked up there. Well, that's the only way they can. Right. Our God would have put them a different way, right? right. You got to have faith. Then you got to have a strong faith. Then to add to that strong faith, you got to have some knowledge. And before you can have temperance, you definitely got to have knowledge, right? right? <clears throat> Our knowledge, faith. But you shall receive power. Our virtue, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in both Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. So that's talking about us. We must have power after that the Holy Ghost comes. Remember, you don't have power before the Holy Ghost comes. Right. You have no power at all. Right. All right? right? The only thing you have, I was, was going to bring it out this morning, and I'll bring it out now. The only power you have before you get born again is to bring yourself to a place where God can work on you. Right. Remember justification. Justification, it chops off your past sins. You still got the same devil in you, but you're putting him in a different environment that he's really uncomfortable with. And I like that because it makes him nervous. Because remember, if you say, I want to get born again, or if you say, I want to change my life, or I want to, uh, you know, I want to give my heart to the Lord. Now, you can do that, but six months later, you're doing the same thing. Yeah. You got to go back. All right, you got to go back. Because something happened in there, that, or something didn't happen, actually. You got to come back and say, hey, I wasn't really sincere. Amen? I wasn't really sincere. If you have sincere justification, that means that it's going to take you all the way to the new birth. Those who is justified, he is already glorified, all right? So it's the journey, but whose responsibility is it? It's yours. If you're going to lean back over here and go back toward that group that you were with, that means that your justification was not one that's going to carry you on to sanctification. It's going to carry you on to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You just found Jesus in jail. I mean, that's what really, I mean, you know, and I believe God does chop off people's past sins. The Bible said he's just. Right. To forgive you. Right. All you got to do is ask. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you died right then, you're going to heaven, but you're not going to be a part of this. Right? right? right. Amen? <clears throat> but now if you do that and then six months later you're still doing the same thing, I'd be careful. Right. All right, you understand? Because it's the it, same thing with these virtues. If this is not helping you, you need to go back to the beginning. Now I lay me down to sleep. Yeah. Most of you know what I'm talking about. Right. All right. Brother Brown said that that guy that was dying, the priest said, "Where you need to go back and find God where you left him. And he started saying, now lay me down to sleep. What happened was he left him when he was a little child. Right. So you got to go back. Listen, remember, God will be right here. Right. Right. He'll be right here waiting on you. If that's where you got to come back to, he'll be right here waiting on you. Right. You just come right back to that spot and say, God, I'm sorry. It wasn't really honest. I really didn't want to be forgiven. And that's really what you got to say. Yeah, I want to be forgiven because I got caught. Right. Most of the time, that's what that is. Right. But really, for godly sorrow leadeth to repentance, then if, you, if you're really sorrow for what, sorrowful for what you do, he will forgive that. Right. Then you've got to walk and continue on. Same thing with these virtues. He said, well, I got the new birth. Okay, you're a baby. We don't want you to stay babies. We want you to have some, some strength where, like Peter Walking in the gate, beautiful. He didn't have to have a church crowd around him. He didn't have to have the atmosphere of, of you know, 14 or 15 deacons or, or, you know, elders of the church around him and building him up. No, it was just him and another guy was with it. They were just walking down the road. Right. Right? right. He didn't have to go get it. It was already there. Right. All right? 
<clears throat> and what did he do is he just displayed that to that man at the gate beautiful. Amen. All right? So that's what we as Christians, <clears throat> because we don't want to stay babies. We don't want to be, we've got to start there. Right. But let's don't end up there. Right. Because you're born a baby and you're an adult. Jesus was a man. Right. And he's expecting us to be a man. Amen. The virtues were working in a man's life. All right? <clears throat> now, we read Acts 1. Now we've come to knowledge faith. And let's look at the, uh, continue with the definition of knowledge faith. <clears throat> Brother Zach. Knowledge signifies in general, in general intelligence, understanding, the general knowledge of Christian religion. But now remember, let me stop for a second. I want to really emphasize this. Just because you read the Bible and you got, you know, 14 stars for reading the Bible 14 times, that means nothing to God. If the most illiterate person can receive the new birth, Brother Luis, that guy can't read. So it must be that God, he listens. God brings something to him and it, what? It affects, it comes in here and then the effect is down here. Right? Because he really can't read. Like Brother Jewel Forney, he couldn't read. He said, God, you've got to teach me to read. If you want me to read your Bible, that's what you've got to do. You've got to teach me to read. And he did. All right? But look, so it's not a, it's, it starts with a general knowledge of Christian religion. Sure. That's why you've got to study. Show yourself approved. I'd rather study two scriptures and know what they are than to read a whole chapter and be reading it like a newspaper or like a book. Because we all know the stories of Noah and, uh, and Moses, and that's just good stories. All right, We want a deeper, more perfect, and enlarged knowledge of this religion, right. such as belongs to the more advanced. That's why you got to be more advanced, up the pyramid, more advanced, especially of things lawful and unlawful for Christians, moral wisdom, such as seen in right living. So it continues on with right living all the way even up into knowledge. Now let's go to temperance. And temperance faith is one that we, that I really think temperance, see it's right there in the middle. We're not far from the top. And you got temperance, right there's the, right there's the key right there. A virtue of one who masters his desire and passions, especially his sensual appetites. And that doesn't have to mean sexual, that means anything sensual that's a, not according to God's word. Because, you know, we, we use that word love all the time. I love to hunt. I love to fish. Well, what are you talking about? What's love? Right? I'm sorry? It's not agape love. That's right. It's not agape love. It's filial love. And actually, that's not even filial love. You're just using it as a word. Right? Yeah, I see. Yeah, thank you. We can stop right there. Mastering, controlling, curbing, restraining, controlling oneself temperate and continent. That's the person, when you get up there to temperance, I'm telling you, that temperance and patience is right in there together, but that is control. That is a controlled faith that we must have. You can't go any further, because remember, once you, as I was telling them downstairs, once you get to temperance, the next thing is your trial. Right. Patience, remember? The tri remember, remember? Patience, faith, there's no way to get patience but by trials. Now, if temperance was up here, Sister Anna Kamani, and patience was down here, you might blow up right here if temperance is above it. Right. But if you've got that self-control in place, right. the trials are going to come, right. right? The trying of your faith, much more precious than gold. It's going to give the, you patience. There's no way to patience but by trials because everything we read, every everyone that we read this morning of patience, faith, is something to do with God trying you. Right. Easy to have patience if you're sitting in the doctor's office and two minutes after you sit down, they take you in. <laughs> then, you, well, I know that's impossible. Sorry. But if you're there for two hours... How are you going to do it? How are you going to feel two minutes versus two hours? The trying of your faith is what's going to do it. So let's go to the definition of patience, and then we'll get to godliness. In your patience, possess your soul. Look, 
steadfastness. Look how much more compacted the scripture says there that we that in Ephesians that we have, everything's compacted. So everything's got to start being squeezed in here. Because look, honestly, you need a whole lot of faith. As you get further up, it's pushing in. Pushing in, it's pressing. It's pressing, it's squeezing you, what? Up. All right, not out, up. All right, steadfastness, constancy, endurance. In the New Testament, the characteristics of a man who has not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings, patiently and steadfastly. Steadfast, waiting for, enduring, sustaining, and perseverance. We've waited 50-something years to come to a place that Brother Branham was at in 1965. 63, actually. God has waited on us and been patient for us to come to a place. That's why Brother Branham, I believe, he said, the first thing we got to do is have patience with God. Then have patience with everybody else. All right, let's go to James 1 and 24, and then we'll start on godliness here in just a second. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into many temptations. Hmm. Count it joy. When you start going through a trial, just start saying, I got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Huh? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, amen, worketh what? Right. One thing for sure, if you're going through a trial and you're having problems with it, God's saying, you don't have enough patience. Because yeah. remember, if you're a son, he's absolutely, he's, he's that tutor. He's the one that's moving you over and showing you this and giving you this way. But he's not a dodeo old granddaddy now. Right. He's not one that's going to clear all this out of the way. No, you're going to go through trials. But it's what you do at the end of that trial. Right? Brother Branham said it's not what you overcome, it's how you overcome it. Right. All right? So the how is how you overcome it with patience. Let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, right. wanting nothing. Right. All right? Have patience. Have patience with God. Listen, we've waited a long time for a body change. Sight and time is God's two worst enemies. Because you and I are what? What is sight? Sight and time. Time is patience. Right? Right? Patience and what? What we see. I thought we're supposed to believe to see, not see to believe. Amen? So how many of you have seen a body change? How many of you saw Jesus die on the cross? How many of you saw Jesus take stripes? How many of you have seen that? So how do you know it's true? How do you know it's true? Something in your heart takes you back to that time that it happened. Now if that don't take you back, you don't have that in here. There's that virtue. That virtue is taking you back to that. And I'm drawing strength from something I can't even see. Right. Oh, I see symbols, I see pictures, I see a cross. But do you see how much we actually do live by faith? We walk by faith, not by sight. Same thing with patience. The trying of your faith worketh patience. So God's going to try your faith for you to believe something you can't even see. You have to believe that your children are already, already saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Right. Amen? Right. Husband, wife, whatever. And you say, well, it's not happened. <coughs> Have some patience. Right. Right. Are you dead yet? Are they dead yet? No. Always a chance, people. Yeah. But when you turn and let sight and time take over, that's what our problem's been. You see all these people leaving the message. They never had, if they didn't, if they did not have that substance faith when the, and get born again, there's nothing for them to look to. Right. 
But with that substance faith inside, that's what God brings us. He brings us that substance faith. Hey, that's what was hanging on the cross. So he projects it now down to us, and we got to believe it by faith. If you don't have that, then you can be, well, you you have no foundation. You can be moved here, you can be moved there, you can get this... You know, you can get this doctrine, you get this, you say Brother Brown was wrong, he was right, and all these things. You see what's happening. The statue of perfect man is so ill-taught, nobody really knows how to get into it, number one, and how to go up it because nobody's teaching it. Right. And really, they're not. All right, now, let's go to the next one, which is godliness. Now, we must have now what? Godliness, faith. Don't lose your faith, but your faith has to become so godly. And I found something here. I've been, you know, Brother Branham really doesn't spend a lot of time on the statue of a perfect man with godliness. He doesn't. It's only just a few paragraphs that he spends on godliness if you've read the book. But remember, the whole thing is godliness, but watch what he does. Watch what he brings in. I'll read the quote in a minute, and I think it's something that will help you, kind of like the control of temperance. This is something that God showed me to what godliness is, and it shows you whether you got it or not. Because, see, we're supposed to be like God when we get born again. Right. Right? right. We're supposed to start acting like God when we're born again. Well, why is this here if we're supposed to act it down here? There's something about this, and I'll read it to you in just a second. But let's go to 1 Timothy 3, 16. <clears throat> this, is all, this is where we were going to start some this morning, but this is where we're, we'll uh, hit godliness and brotherly kindness. And without controversy... So there's no controversy. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in the glory. Now how many believe that? Amen. Amen. Without controversy then, we must not have any controversy that that's what that is. That that was God that did that. Right? Right? And it's a mystery because the mystery comes in us. God's a mystery to the world, but we're a mystery to the world because we're God here manifested on the earth. Now watch this. Go to 1 Timothy 4. Timothy talks a lot about this, or Paul does. But refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. There's that word again, exercise. For bodily exercise profiteth little, which it does, a little, But godliness is profitable unto all things. Right. All right. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Now, what were we talking about there in in 2 Peter? It says we're talking about life and godliness. All right. So this is life and godliness. What you're doing is you're bringing the life that should have lived had there not been a fall. You're bringing it back here. Right. You got that? That's what we're bringing back is the life that we should have lived. Amen. All right? Because remember, that Genesis 126 man never fell. That Genesis 126 man never had to say, God, forgive me of my sins. Right. That's right. So if we get back to that, Amen. that's when the body change happens, right. people. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. But godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that is now and of that which is to come. All right, now, let's go to the definition of godliness. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go to 1 Timothy 6. I messed you up, didn't I? 1 Timothy 6, 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. I want you to think about that. Godliness with contentment. In other words, be content. What? Settle. Patience. Temperance. You see how they're stacking on top of each other? Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain that we carry nothing out. So all that, you know, we and it's fine. I, and I, I really think we ought to be successful in life. I, think, I don't think we ought to be just, you know, brain dead. But I don't think that we should build our hopes on this world but on getting to that, bringing that other world in manifestation because it's going to be way better than this. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I want you to listen to that and hold it. <clears throat> now let's define what godliness is. Strong's 
concordance, is, this is all it says about it. Reverent, respect, piety towards God. Now, look at that word there. Right. Let's take that word. Let's read quote number 12. This is from the Statue of Perfect Man. Brother Brown says, but if you got genuine faith and put genuine virtue to it, then genuine knowledge and genuine temperance, genuine patience. See, you're moving right on up the line. Fifthly, add godliness. Oh, my, godliness to be added. What does godliness mean? I looked in four or five dictionaries and couldn't even find what it meant. Finally, I was down at Brother Jeffrey's there, and we found it in a dictionary. Godliness means to be like God. Right. Oh, my, after you got faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, then be like God. You say, I can't do it, Brother Branham. Oh, yes, you can. Right. That's right. Then he's talking about reading. Now, what he reads is, is he reads Matthew 5, 48, be ye therefore perfect. Right. But then he comes and reads, keep scrolling up. We're going to read this. And then he actually goes to Ephesians and reads what we've been reading where the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists is for the perfecting of the saints. You get way up here now before you're asked to do that. All these things has to be added first. Then when you get up here, he's asking you now to be perfect, godliness, sons and daughters of God. Right. How many things I could say along that line? Then he turns to Ephesians 4, and he reads that. Scroll on up. This is a, I think this is a pretty long quote. But he reads the same thing I read, talking about the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, for the perfecting of the saints. Right. Who are the saints? The sanctified ones. Amen. The ones started from down here. Right? So you got to be born again. you got to be a saint before you can be a sanctified one. Right? <clears throat> then he talks about the perfecting of the saints and going up. Perfect. Takes godliness. You have to add to your faith godliness. See, you ain't left faith. So that's godliness, faith. See, you start off down here with virtue. Then you go to knowledge. Then you go to temperance. Then you go to patience. Now you're on godliness. And then he talks about to be like Jesus. Keep scrolling up. <clears throat> Godly, always looking for one thing. I always do that which pleases the Father. Right. Always do that which pleases the Father. See, yes, sir, always. That's godliness, see? Right. All right, so what we're doing now is we're looking at something because, you know, there's another form of godliness. Second Timothy tells you there's a form of, they have a form of godliness, but right. denying the power thereof. A form of godliness, not godliness, a form of godliness. Right. But look, what he's saying is always looking for one thing. I always do that which pleases the Father. And I came to, uh, I was looking through a little more, a few more quotes and looking, and I thought, Lord, what, what is something that we can do to make it, we're supposed to be godly here, but why did you put godliness right here, right before brotherly kindness? Here's what came to me. Take it for a grain of salt, or you can take it from the Lord. But godliness to me is a respect for the gifts of God yeah. or the person that is gifted. Right. See, you've come all the way up here this far. You've got all these virtues, but there has to be something, and because it, it does, it shows that godliness is a respect. Right. You must have a respect for the gifts of God. Once you get that far, because look, the next thing is what? Brotherly kindness. Right. If you don't have, you got to have respect for the gift of God first, then you're going to have to have respect for the brethren. Right. Got it? Right. See how they're stacking on top of each other. Respect for God, remember? Have patience with God first. Have respect for God's word or God's gifts first. Right. Then you're going to come to brotherly kindness. And brotherly kindness is the one that's going to, you know, it's going to knock us off a little bit maybe. Brotherly kindness is tough. But remember, brotherly kindness, kindliness is right at where God is getting ready to absolutely make you an instrument that he wants to use. Right? right. But we got to get that one little thing out of the way called brotherly kindness. So godliness faith is a respect for the gifts of God. Yeah. All the gifts of God we respect. All You say, well, no, it's not... You say, well, that's speaking in tongues. Why does everybody go to that one? Those are the last ones. Yeah. The gifts of God is what? Wisdom, faith, and all those spiritual gifts. We come there and we see that now we need that kind of godliness to take us up one more part higher. We must have respect. Yeah. 
respect for each other is what's coming up. But respect for God. Respect for the gifts of God. And know where they're placed. And you know what? Know how to use them. Because what did Jesus do? I always do that which pleases my Father. So did Jesus do anything that didn't please the Father? If he didn't, the Scripture's wrong. You say, well, he did this, he did that. I always do that which pleases the Father. Did Jesus have respect? Yeah, I think he did. He had respect to the Father, didn't he? Didn't he? He put all the honor on the Father. Right? He had respect. That's the godliness you and I are going to have to have is what? It's not up here where you say, I got godliness. You got to come to me. I like what Brother Chris is not here, but he's in the back, and I'm sure he won't mind me saying it. He walked out there and he said, I'm sure you're telling I'm sure glad you're telling these people how to treat me. <laughs> Think about that a little while. He was laughing and I know what he was talking about. He was talking about himself. But he said, I'm sure glad you're telling these people how to treat me. But really, I mean and really you gotta be that way. You can't say, Well, I get up here and you go, Well, I've got all these great gifts. See, there would be no respect there. Right, you everybody understand what I'm saying? There'd be no respect there. There'd be no godliness. I could have all these other virtues and not have the godliness about myself to know that to respect that I know where that gift come from. Right. I know where the gift in Brother Richard Marlowe. All you everybody everybody's gifted. Right. But you gotta have respect for that gift when you come to right there because you know what? You fish and get real close to that person. Yeah. Right. You know, temperance is something you gotta work on. Patience is something you've got to work on. Brotherly kindness is really something you've got to work on. But you're working on it with somebody else. And it's brotherly kindness. See, you can have patience and have patience with the world. You can have temperance and have temperance you know, with the world. But brotherly kindness, that's you and your brother. Amen? So it's bringing it right into the family and we're seeing that, sure, it's all in the family, but but godliness is a respect for the gifts of God. So remember that. I believe that's what Brother Bradham was trying to say, is having respect of where it came from, how it got to you, and how you're using it. Remember, power without character. To me, that's a character. Godliness is a character that we need to show respect for the gifts of God. And then, of course, 2 Timothy 3, 4 through 7, I just threw that in there because it's a different kind of godliness. It's a form of godliness. Right. You can't, listen, the form of godliness is right here. You can't even get in the body having a form of godliness. That's religion. Religion is a form of godliness. Because they want to act, like I said many times, you know, they, they get religious around you. Right. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the what? Power thereof. In other words, not showing respect for the gifts. Amen? Not showing respect for the gift. They're denying the power. They're Actually, they're denying where it come from. From such, turn away. And then it tells you what to do. So let's go now to brotherly kindness faith. Next one. Next chart, brotherly kindness, faith. We're going to be coming right up here to the top. All right? Bless you. Brotherly kindness. All right? We're going we're gonna to read a few quotes here, but brotherly kindness, Romans 12. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kind affection one to another with brotherly love. Because remember, brotherly love and kindness, brotherly kindness is the same thing. Yeah. All right, brotherly love, brotherly kindness is the same thing. In honor, preferring one another. What I tell you about godliness? Respect to the gifts. Right. Now you're going to start respecting the person. Right. Oh, it's easier to respect the gift. Sometimes it's not easy to respect the person. Yeah. So that's what we're getting to, though. you got to do it. That's the last point. Let me make this point. Look, that's the last point before God puts that seal. Right? right? What is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is a what? A seal. Right. right? The Holy Spirit. We're sealed right here until the day of our redemption, absolutely, in our soul. But when we get to right here, God's going to put another stamp on you. It's not another Holy Ghost, but it's going to be a stamp that the world's going to be able to see. 
I hope. But Romans 12, verse 9 through 10, let love be without a simulation. You read that. Now let's go to 1 Thessalonians 4. He therefore that despises, despises not man but God. All right? So now, if we despise a person, if that person has God in them and he's at, the, at godliness, we despise that person. We got a problem. Right. We got a problem with God. Right. Because you're not despising the man, but God. Right. Who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. This shouldn't be a hard one. But it's the hardest one. It's right up there at the top. All right? For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. So we're supposed to do that. <clears throat> so now let's go to the definition of brotherly kindness, which you know what that is. It's Philadelphia. That's what that means. Brotherly love, brotherly kindness, love of the brethren. Love of brothers or sisters, brotherly love. In the New Testament, the love which Christians cherish for each other as brethren. Now, the problem that we have is, the problem, and we'll read it here in just a minute from Brother Branham, the problem we have is, is we say, well, if Brother Dale loves us, loves us I love him. Yeah. That's the way we want to be. Yeah. Right? That's the way we want to be. We, we don't want to be the one that portrays the love first. Yeah. We want him to love us, and then it'll be easier for us to love him. Right. Yeah. Or anybody. I right, put anybody in that place. It's really... Uh, you know, if Jesus said the two greatest commandments and we read them was the, the Lord your God is one and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now look, I got two neighbors that are gay. Pick that one up. I've got to love them as much as I love me regardless of what they do because there's no stipulation. But remember, through this whole thing, it's got to be an overcoming. It'd be real easy if Brother Al and Sister Anna lived on one side of me and Brother Hal and Sister Ardy lived on the other side. And, you know, Mom and Daddy live on down here and Anna and Richard and Terrence and Lisa, you know. But they're sticking right beside me. It's something that you got to deal with. But it'd be easy if we had a commune. With all of us that live there, and we all live there, and we all praise the Lord, and we all didn't. That's too easy. That's too easy. You know, I put a Richard Marlowe in your yard and see what happens. <laughs> Boy, if he was just a lot nicer, I'd be a lot nicer to him. That's not what this is. This is what? Love of brothers and sisters. Not the love they give you, it's the love you project to them. Right. All right? <clears throat> and I'm being serious because, look, this is, this is, to me, this is the hinge point. If we get through this, that's the whole thing. I believe that's what's stopping. I know it's what's stopping me, and I'll just admit it. I, you got to have brotherly kindness, and you give it, you know, we give all kind of examples, but the, the greatest example is that you love that, you got to love that neighbor unconditionally, doesn't matter if he loves you, doesn't matter if he's a Christian, doesn't matter. Let's look and we'll see what Brother Brown says, quote number 13. <clears throat> well, that's another one, another uh, part of a uh, definition. But let's read this, look. Sixthly, let's add, the Bible said, add brotherly love, brotherly kindness. Now, that's a good one right here. The sixth, seventh, all right, adding brotherly kindness. All right. When we get to that, brotherly kindness, put yourself in his place on the matter. Now you say, my brother sinned against me, said Peter. Shall I forgive him, he said, seven times a day? Jesus said 70 times seven, right. which those of us that don't, can't, add, can't cipher, that's 490 times. Right. A day. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a weekly or a yearly quota. Right. That's a day. Brotherly kindness. Now, you see, if a brother is all out of tune, don't be impatient with him, see? See, that's where it comes down to patience. See, no, see, be kind to him. Go anyway. Someone said not long ago, how can you believe these things the way you do and still go to the assemblies of God and the oneness, all the rest? Then put, see, brotherly kindness, see, see? Hoping someday, see, patient with him, see? Temperate, enduring. He's going through this whole list. Knowledge to understand what he believes. Remember, it's in his heart. That's what is. Virtue in yourself to let it go out with kindness, meekness to him. 
having faith that someday God will bring him in. Now, he used every one of those virtues right there. Right. Stacked them right on top of each other, just like we've been doing. You wonder where we get this from. Right. He got it first. Brotherly kindness, the seventh thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Brother Ram taps on the chalkboard. Seven things. Now you're coming. Next thing, then add charity, which is love. That's the capping stone. And then we're going to get to that <coughs> maybe when we get back from Brother Joe Green's. Not this Sunday, but the next. All right. Let's go to number 14. Let's read this one here. Now you might say, look, I sure don't like Brother Neville. Or I sure don't like Brother Jones. I don't like Brother so-and-so and something like that. But just let something happen to him, brother. Your heart's broke. It just nearly killed you, see? We can obtain brotherly kindness and feeling for one another, see? But to maintain in a group of people. Now look, he's making a point here. I want you to stop. He's making a point. We can obtain brotherly kindness and feeling for, the, for, for one for another if it's one for one right here. Right. But when you get a group of people right. that don't like that guy. Yeah. See right here? But to maintain in a group of people. Where's Benjamin? Where's Michael? We can obtain that. Why do you care for that brother? Because you broke bread with him here at the altar, as you will tonight. We're actually going to break bread tonight. We're taking communion. Right. You fellowship with him. You shook his hand. You worship with him. He's your brother. And he might do something in the flesh that you would disagree with because you just kind of stay, which you oughtn't do, but shun him a little bit. Yeah. But in the bottom of your heart, if something happened to that brother, it would just nearly kill you or that sister. Right. Now, if we have such a hatred toward people that we want to see something bad happen to people, no. we're in trouble. Right. You need to go back down to justification. Right. You're on that shoots and ladder game <laughs> where you think you're going to be almost at the... Aaron and I, Aaron plays shoots and ladders last night. Shoots and ladders, you get right up there to almost at the top, and there's a big old ladder that goes all the way down to the bottom. How many of you have played that? Raise your hand. You rest of your secret centers. But you slide all the way down to the bottom. Bro, Dick. It's a board game. And it has ladders that when you hit it, you can climb up and you go to another. It's like a journey. And then if you get up to a certain spot and you hit that point, there's a ladder and you have to slide all the way down and start all over again. Playing with dice and stuff like that. So, Well... Oh, you didn't want to be on Secret Center, did you? But a lot of us played. I mean, it's a popular game. For those of us that lived out in the country, we we played with uh, played with those kind of games. Those those were neat, and that was good times. You know, there wasn't no television program. We didn't have to worry about that. We grew up without a TV, so we played board games. So, but anyway, shoots and ladders. And that's the way it is with this. Look, he said, you come up this far, and then. You know, all the way down to the bottom. If you can't love, listen, now, and, and this is the point I want to make, there's people that humanly you don't like to be around. Okay? Brother Branham even said, and I wasn't going to bring the quote because I don't want to deal too much on that side of it. He said, there's Christians that you can't stand to be in the room with because of the clash of your natures. But like he said right here, if something happens to that brother... First thing you say, you don't say. First thing you should say is, "God have mercy," you know. Right. But instead of going, "Well, he deserved that," oh, no. you know, that's like this. I, I don't, didn't mean to bring it out, but just like this, this Horatio Spafford, all them secret, all them people that back in Chicago was saying, "Hey, he must have done something wrong. Right. He was a sinner. He done something wrong. God punished him for doing all that." No. He was right there in the will of God right. to write that song that I believe will be sung for eternity. We'll sing these songs for an eternity <clears throat> because I believe it's, a, it's part of the growth process <clears throat> of the man and they were saying that it was something that God done to him. Right. You have to be careful. Brotherly kindness you have to be real careful with. In all sincerity, that is the place where we all need a lot of help. Amen? Amen. First thing, if somebody does something to you, what's the first thing you want to do? Get back at them. Yeah. First thing you want to do, I want to get back at him. I want to do something that he has made me uncomfortable. That beard on Brother Collie is bugging the hound out of me. <laughs> 
Do I? Looks like Uncle Ray. I don't think I've ever seen him with a beard. So it's aggravating me. I, I'm, I'm tired of it, brother. Stop it. I'll get over it. Brotherly kindness. That shouldn't have anything to do with anything. You understand what I'm saying? I'm, it's like uh, uh, Sister Anna Kamani. She's kind of my she's kind of my rudder every once in a while. And she's and she's very smart and intellectual. She said, "Brother Wade, that's not the first sermon Brother Brandon preached was faith. You don't know that that's the first sermon he preached, and I don't know if that's the first sermon he preached, but it's the first sermon on tape that he preached. So I need to make it. So I need to make it. I need to make it right. She's crawling under the seat now." So. But I need to, I really, I do. I need, I, I, I get that from all of you, and I appreciate that. I, I, I hope that, that, Brother Dale, all of us ministers are so approachable that you can come and say, hey, that's not, that just wasn't exactly what you should have done, or, or, or you're like her. You know, she said, you need to explain that because you don't know the fast of first sermon. And that's the truth, and I appreciate that. You know what? That didn't make me not like her. That makes me, you know, love her more as a sister to know that somebody's listening. Because somebody on the internet or somebody that's just come here the first time, they'll if they search through the the uh, you know look through and they say, well, that was not the first sermon he preached. He started preaching in 1920 something, and here it is 1940 something. And that's not the first. It's confusion. We need to stop the confusion. And I'm sorry because I caused that. It was the first sermon we know that Brother Brown put on tape for us to listen to. Was faith is the substance. So I thank you for that. Not to embarrass you at all. I know it did. Your face is not red. Where are you at, Michael? But brotherly kindness. Listen, like I said, it's real easy, though, for us to love each other, really. It should be easy for Christians to love each other. It really should. But sometimes it's not. Just like that. Now, if I would have been some people being a preacher and some woman tell me that I did something wrong and says you need to correct it? Oh, her head would have hit the floor and rolled all the way to the back. Some preachers couldn't have stood it till they got in the pulpit and did that. Amen? Seen it happen before many times. We have to be careful. We have people come in here, and I've seen ministers at fellowship meetings. A woman comes in and sits down in the front row, and her hair's real short. First sermon she's ever been to. Now, how's brotherly kindness going to be projected when he stands right here and goes, cutting your hairs of the devil, and, you know. You're right. That ain't a lot of any of that. Definitely knowledge. Probably even the Holy Ghost. Because, look, brotherly kindness is preferring your brother before yourself. Jesus did not die for himself. He died for me and you. He didn't have to die. He was God Almighty. He didn't have to come down here and do this. But he wanted to. Because you know what? He wanted, he's so unselfish, he owned all these virtues before there ever was one Adam. Like Brother Dale's been preaching. Before anything. He was those virtues. But he did not want to be alone with those virtues. Because look, how are you going to have any of them without having somebody to project it to? So he's got a family now. He's got sons and daughters that he projects this to and expects us to live it if we believe that that's what he came for. Was to give us these what? Gifts. These virtues are gifts that God's give us. So let's use them as we're coming on up a little bit further. Right. Man, you're right here at Brotherly Kindness. You, you know, you get all these things working in your life. You uh, uh, have respect for God's gift, and then you've got to have respect for the person. Right. All right? <clears throat> let's look at number, quote number 15. <clears throat> we'll be finished here in just a second. I'll let you chew on this till we start back over in a couple of weeks. Look. If Pentecost was God's vine, this is I will restore. This is not in the Statue of Perfect Man book. Now, this is the one that's going. This is one I'll see if you can swallow. If Pentecost was God's vine, which was the new vine that has grown up, then these four destroyers has been the one that eat the vine down. Now, you remember the palmer worm, locust, caterpillar, all that. All right, so that's what he's talking about. 
Now let's find out what Pentecost had. Now not 1906. Let me explain that. Not 1906 Pentecost, but the true Pentecost, the one that started right down here in the first church age, all right? <clears throat> there in, in uh, right after the death of Jesus and coming back on the day of Pentecost, all right? Find out the destroyer, who they are, well, what did it? Now, the first thing that Pentecost produced was brotherly love. Right. It tore down the middle wall of partitions and made a brotherhood. Because you see what Pentecost done in 1906? It totally reversed that. They started putting walls up. They started putting petitions up. Brother Brown said, you've, you've cabbaged down. You've stopped here. Well, the first Pentecost did not. So they are not a total pattern of the first Pentecost. Right. All right? It tore down the middle wall of petitions and made a brotherhood to such a way they had everything in common in the Bible days, a brotherhood. Right. This is where downstairs it got a little bit touchy. I told y'all today to bring, make sure you brought your cash. Did you bring all your cash? Did you bring your checkbook? Title to your house and all your cars? No? You're supposed to give them all to Brother Dale and me, Brother Terrence, Brother Luis. Brother Luis, quit smiling. That's what they did in the first church age. That's what Brother Branham said was to such a way they had everything in common. Right. You remember, brother, Paul spoke of brotherhood and he gave all the gifts of the Pentecostal church and he said, First Corinthians, Lord, speak with tongue of men and angels and not have charity. But what do you do? They brought all the money in. They trusted. Now, how about trusting a brother? How about trusting Peter, who can't even write? So he can't make an invoice. But they just piled everything in and they gave as was needed in the first church age. Yeah. That was brotherly love. Yeah. That's what he said. That's right. right? Boy, it's yeah. good and quiet. <laughs> but remember, Ananias and Sapphira was part of that group. Right. Now what did they do? They sold all their goods. Listen, this is what they've done. They sold all their goods. They did what the disciples said. They sold all their goods, but when they walked in before Peter, Peter said, is this all? They said, yes, or he did, said, yes, this is all. Peter discerned that if he got $20,000, he only brought 10 into the pot. He kept 10 for himself. And what happened to him? He fell dead right there. Right. Peter said, you've not lied to me. You've lied to the Holy Ghost. Right. So now what I'm telling you today is you don't have to bring your money and your cash and all that. We don't need it. But I want you to start bringing all to these services. Bring everything you got, every title deed to faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, everything you got you bring to this service. And don't leave it at that door. You bring it right here. I don't want your money. Brother Dale don't want your money. We don't need it. But that's what they did, though. That was brotherly kindness. You know what they did? They trusted those brethren so much till they did. Here, I just, I just sold my house. I just sold all my cattle, and here's the money. You do with it what God tells you to do with it. That's how much they trusted not just the gift of God anymore. They trust the people with the gift. You see how this is stacking on top of each other? You got to respect the gift. But you got to respect where it come from. Right. They respected them so much. Now this is right before the headstone. Now remember, they didn't get that. The first church age didn't get. They have no. They didn't get the headstone. They didn't get Christ in His fullness. But they got so close. So they gave everything they had. Because remember what? When Jesus hung on the cross, did He hold something back? He gave all. He gave everything He had. For me and you, so why can't we in turn turn around and give it all back to him? Yeah. Everything we do, all the work that we do, whether it be natural, whether it be spiritual, whether it be anyway. Let's roll it up again right here. Jesus said, this will all men know that you're my disciples when you have love one for the other. Right. Pentecost had it. Right. 
I'm speaking Pentecost, meaning the first group of apostles and the disciples. They had that brotherly love. They wasn't greedy. They sold everything they had and for the, further, for the furthering of the church. The only way you're going to make this church profitable is come here. Do what God said. And you know what? God's going to have to give you a blessing. He's going to have to because he said, I'll give you a blessing that you can't contain. All right? They sold everything they had for the furthering of the church. They were so together till even when one heard of the other one died, they said, let's go and die with him. Such a feeling. Can you say that about yourself? Can you see Brother Donnie or, or Brother Joe or anybody in a situation? I, I told Brother Hal, and I meant it from the bottom of my heart. I said, if I could take that away from you and give it to me, I'd take it. That's where you got to be. That's where you got to be. Now, let's don't be foolish and say, God, take the cancer off of this one and give it. You know, don't, let's don't be foolish. But if a man's sick, what's Brother Brown say? The little girl, the little, the little woman that was sitting on the row... They had a sick baby. A mother came around, laid hands on her, and he said, that's where the baby got her healing. Right. Right. Why? That lady entered into brotherly love because you know what? If a sister's having a problem, I can't relate to that. Right? But if a brother has a problem... I can relate to that and enter into that problem. So you sisters are, have just as much of a responsibility to enter in if, if one sister's having a problem or two sisters having a problem. Enter into that. Don't separate yourself from it. Enter into it. And I meant that with Brother Hal. Many, uh, you know, you, you look at people and you say, man, if I could just take that away from them. Right. Just give it to me. I'll take it. That's what Jesus said, wasn't he? Right? right. right. Cast your burdens on me. Right. I'm not making me Jesus, but we're supposed to act like him. Right? That's why Brother Dale has problems in his body. I told him the other day, I said, you're just like Brother Jess. You do everything, I'm going to say it. You do everything. You don't have no delegation skills. You don't tell people to go do this, do this, do this. You do it all yourself. Brother Jess Trammell was the same way. 75 years old, he had a stroke. Your body, listen, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, but your body is still under sin. Your body is still under sin and has the effects of it. Listen, we're all getting older. This is falling out, okay? I told him the other day, I said, I don't know how in the world you preached three sermons, worked two jobs, and built my house and Terrence's house and Anna's house. I don't know how he did it. After two services doing this, I'm dead dog tired. Why? Because it's a strain. It's a strain. Look at Brother Branham. He was 56 years old. I'm 55. He was 56 when he died. He looked about 70. He was old. Why? Jesus. He was 30 years old. They thought he was 50. Why? Because the man had brotherly kindness. He took on. He took on the sins of the world. Jesus did. And then us, we must bear each other's burden. And we should. I don't want Brother Howell to be sick. He's been sick for weeks. I don't want no more of that. And I don't have to physically take that on. But you know what? Like Brother Dale did that day, he, he took a quarter and said, here, let me buy your headache. Right. Well, that wasn't wizardry, that was faith. Right. That was putting confidence in somebody to say, here, right. I want to take that from you. Right. That's the same way with brotherly kindness. We must now bind together, not be all lovey-dovey, because you know what, the world and, and people that, has a, um, that doesn't have the new birth, they take it to like you're talking about. Because yeah. <laughs> remember, Brother Brown said, agape love, then filial love, then what? Lust, then it just keeps going. It keeps deteriorating all the way down. All right, Eros and all that stuff. Because what they're doing is, our in our being, we're supposed to love a creator, a God, something. We're supposed to love something because that's what we're supposed to love, right? And what happens with Satan is, is he brings it over this way and brings it into Eros, filial love, and all those things over here. God has got agape love, and it never moves. It stays right here. It's constant. It stays right there. Yeah, exactly. That's who he is. That's the headstone that we're missing that hopefully that we can get into. But I like this right here where this is. Some people go berserk, but I like that right there where it says Holy Spirit. We'll, we'll get into that in a couple of Sundays. Let's stand.
<clears throat> but brotherly kindness, put yourself in that person's position right. before you start judging right. or anything. All right? right? I hope that kind of helped you a little bit. Furthering on into godliness. God, but remember, godliness... Godliness is a respect for the gifts of God. Right. All right? Then when you go up to a little bit higher, if that... Listen... If your filter says that Brother Dale has a gift of God, then you must respect the gift of God, but you right. must respect the person who go along with it. Because right. look how bad they got with Brother Brown. They said, oh, we respect the gift when it was working with a discernment, but when he's preaching, yeah. how messed up can that be? Right. I mean, how messed up can that be? God can't keep his word straight? No. Now, those people had a different attitude than they should have had if they would have had brotherly kindness. Say, old Dr. Bosworth, he had brotherly kindness. Right. He said, oh, Brother Branham, you need to get on the field. You need to get out there before everybody. You know, before Brother Bosworth died, he's telling Brother Branham all these things he needed to do. Right. Well, now, he could have been like the rest of them and said, well, now, you, you know, you're, don't go out there doing any preaching. No, he said, get on the field. Get out there before the fanaticism gets out there. <clears throat> so we must find the gifts, where they're coming from, respect them, and then respect of our brothers, brotherly kindness. Right. Kind of hard to do. Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Think about that. Think about that. We're fixing to take communion. And we need to, we need to really, as we're taking communion, realize that as sons and daughters of God, it's a, it's a requirement. It's, it's something that we, we're supposed to do as Christians. We're supposed to take communion. But now if you're not a Christian then you're not supposed to take communion. Because right. if you do, then, then you're, you're harming yourself. Now, what's a Christian? Christ-like. Right. That's someone born again. All right? And if you don't, then you see all these things, and, and you see, Brother Dale's going to read it in just a minute, you're going to see that there's things that, there's blessings and there's cursings. Right. All right? So as we take communion, it should be the born-again believer, or, Brother Brown even said, those believing unto, but now not just because you want to drink some wine and eat some bread, right? That's why communion with brotherly kindness, that's why they all had everything in common. There was not one. I love that where St. Martin, he wasn't satisfied until he went through his whole congregation and they all got born again. Well, see, then when you take communion, you don't do this. You don't, you know, you're sitting there taking communion. You're sitting there taking communion and you kind of go, see if Brother Dick's taking it. See if this one's taken. I see some of y'all do that. Yeah. What have they done? Yeah. That's not brotherly kindness. Right. You better worry about you. Right. And you know, if a, if a, if a, a stranger comes in and takes communion, what are you going to do? Right. It's open communion. Right. You don't know what that person's done, right. or, or what? They, right, exactly. It's your choice right. to take it. I'm just telling you that if you take it though, and you live a like Brother Claude said, you take it and you live a hound dog life, you're gonna get what a hound dog gets. Yeah. Sometimes he gets shot and run over. That's what he says. So just realize that it's it's a it's a sacred thing. It's just for the believers. Right. There was no unbelievers in that upper room when the 120 received the Holy Ghost. They were in communion one with the other. 120 people. That's why Brother Brown said if the church of Ephesus was a powerful church, all 12 people were born again. Yeah. And they, were, they had these virtues working in their life. Give me a church like that. I don't need 500 or 300 or 100. Give me 12 people that will believe the Word of God, live it, right. be it. I, I'll take that any day of the week. Right. Okay? You love the Lord? Before we take communion, let's pray. I want to pray. We'll pray for us, and then we'll take, uh, take communion. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, that today what's said has been satisfactory to you, Lord, that we've said it from the bottom of our heart, that we believe that if we don't live these virtues, that we're, we're living way below our privileges. And, Lord, we want to project that, 
virtue and knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, project it to the people so that they'll see it. And they'll see Christ living in a human being. Because the only part of you that the earth's going to ever see, Lord, on this side of judgment is us. The people walking through the streets of Satan's Eden, the worst, most dark hour ever on the face of the earth, yet you've got your little bride walking through it. You said you'd protect us. You said you'd take care of us. Lord, as we go further into this service for the communion, Lord, as we take the communion, if there be any sick among us, Lord, may you heal them now, Father, and keep them strong. Not just heal them. Keep them strong. Let the, nothing come against us, Lord. Let us all bind together and be one in you, Father. Forgive us of our sins and our mistakes and our thoughts against you, Lord, that are contrary. We pray that you would just bless each one of us. Take care of us and lead us and guide us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Dale. Bless you. Bless you.